Well, good morning and thank you all for coming. Um, up until yesterday morning, I had absolutely nothing to say. And the day before that, and the day before that, and the day before that, I just had absolutely nothing to say. Um, in contrast to the last time I gave a talk when I felt so inspired and full of the Dharma and um, I don't know what the word is. Um, so these things do come and go. And then a friend suggested, rather loudly, I'm afraid, outside, <laughs> uh, the miracle of mindfulness, to use this as a source. Now, I have not, I had not read this book. This is a classic by Thich Nhat Hanh. I had not read this since the 80s, and it made absolutely no impression on me whatsoever, because I remember none of it. And I think in order for it to make an impression on one, uh, one has to um, have way seeking mind um, and an aspiration to wake up. And at the time, I don't think I had either one of those. <laughs> Although I was certainly open, I was not that I was close to it. Um, it just was not in uh, my purview. Um, I was in grad school at the time, and that's really all I could think about. So, um, I'm just going to start right off reading. By the way, um, so Thich Nhat Hanh talks a lot about breath and a lot about mind. Now, we've heard a lot of discussions about breath. I think some of the things he has to say about mind and breath are unique, um, very helpful, um, encouraging, and gentle and kind. I, I really liked the way he put this. Um, and I'm hoping that some of what I read that he says doesn't give you too many ideas. And he gets a little concerned about that as well. Um, but you know, we all take risks. Um, he says, uh, starting out, mindfulness is the miracle by which we master and restore ourselves. This is such an interesting example. Consider a magician who cuts his body into many parts and places each part in a different region, hands in the south, arms in the east, legs in the north, and then by some miraculous power, lets forth a cry which reassembles all, every part of his body. This is a magician. Mindfulness is like that. It is the miracle which can call back in a flash our dispersed mind and restore it to wholeness so that we can live each minute, he says, each moment of life. And then uh, the next subheading is uh, taking hold of one's breath. As I said, he focuses on breath and mind, not so much posture. It seems like the people to whom he is speaking can already get into the lotus or the half lotus. Don't worry about it. I've sat in a chair for years. Um, he says, taking hold of one's breath. Thus, mindfulness, this is so interesting. I had not thought of it this way. Is at the same time a means and an end. The seed and the fruit. When we practice mindfulness in order to build up concentration, take that very lightly, Mindfulness is a seed, but mindfulness itself is the life of awareness. The presence of mindfulness means the presence of life, and therefore mindfulness is also the fruit. Mindfulness frees us of forgetfulness and dispersion and makes it possible to live fully each minute of life. Mindfulness enables us to live. And then he says, 
you should know how to breathe to maintain mindfulness as breathing is a natural and extremely effective tool which can prevent dispersion of the mind. Breath is the bridge which connects life to consciousness, which unites your body as breath originates in the body to your thoughts. Whenever your mind becomes scattered, use your breath as the means to take hold of your mind again. Now we've here at Dharma Field, we've had a lot of instruction uh, in the use of the breath. Um, and interestingly, I was thinking of, over this, Dogen does not talk much about breath in uh, the Fukan Zazengi, which is universal recommendation for Zazen. He focuses on posture and he focuses on mind. Um, he does mention the breath to keep your mouth and lips closed, breathe through your nose, but he doesn't say a whole lot about it. Um, and then in contrast, Thich Nhat Hanh goes into a long discussion of the breath. Um, and this is based on the Sutra of Mindfulness, the Sutra on Breath to Maintain uh, Mindfulness. I'll get to that. This says the Anapada Sutra. The Anapada, no, I'll get to that. Okay, never mind. Um, now, actually, what we're taught in this sutra is pretty much what we teach here at Dharma Field. Breathing in, notice breathing in. Breathing out, notice breathing out. And then he gives instructions based on the sutra um, about lengthening the breath or shortening the breath. Um, the sutra of mindfulness teaches the method to take hold of. <laughs> Uh, one's breath in the following man's manner. Being ever, ever mindful, breathe in and mindful, breathe out. Breathing in a long breath, no. Breathing in a long breath. Breathing out a, light, a long breath, no. Breathing out a long breath. And so on with the short breath. And then it says, experiencing a whole body breath, breathe in. Thus train yourself, experiencing the whole breath body. Breathe out, knowing you're breathing out. Thus train yourself. Calming the activity of the breath body, breathe in. Thus you train yourself. Calming the activity of the breath body, breathe out, thus train yourself. He says, in a Buddhist monastery, everyone learns to use breath as a tool to stop mental disturb dispersion and build up concentration power. Concentration power is the strength which comes from practicing mindfulness. It is the concentration, he says, some, he says two different things here. It is the concentration which can help one obtain the great awakening. And then he says, when a worker, meaning someone in the monastery or someone working in his order, um, takes hold of breath, they, he uses the he pronoun, they have already become awake, awakened. So Dogen says the same thing. Dogen says, um, if you want to attain suchness, practice suchness without delay, uh, that's awakening right there. Hang on one second. So here at Dharma Field, we say, as I, as I said, when we go to meditation instruction, we're taught breathing in, Notice breathing in as you breathe in. Breathing out, notice breathing out as you breathe out. And we don't try to manipulate the length um, of the breath generally, do we? Um, it's just breathing normally, but becoming aware of the breath. Um, the breath is the focus of the attention. And it's something, it's an anchor. We can 
anchor, as he says, our mind, if it gets dispersed, this dispersion of the mind, like the magician who, who seems to cut himself up into pieces and disperses the parts, like so the breath serves to bring the mind back. We can focus on the breath in that way and use it. He goes along. He talks about lying down and breathing, but we're not going to go there. Um, quiet breathing. He does talk about quiet breathing. I don't know if any of you has ever sat a session. And, you know, it, it requires patience. It requires tolerance. It requires a willingness to um, submit to circumstances that uh on a prolonged basis that may not be uh, what you prefer in the moment. But he does say um, your breath should be light, even and flowing, like a thin stream of water running through the sand. Your breath should be very quiet so that a person sitting next to you cannot hear you breathe. Uh, I don't know if any of you has ever sat next to someone um, who's breathing so loudly for whatever reason that you can hear their breathing. Um, good noticing, by the way. <laughs> um, your breathing should flow gracefully like a river, like a water snake crossing the water. You know, have you ever seen a, a water snake slither along the surface? Attention of the, it's beautiful to watch. Uh, so he says, your breathing should flow gracefully, not like, <laughs> this is funny, a chain of rugged mountains or the gallop of a horse. To master our breath is to be in control of our bodies and minds. Each time we find ourselves dispersed and find it difficult to gain control of ourselves by different means, uh, the method of watching the breath should always be used. And that's what we teach here at Dharma Field. Just return to the breathing. The instant you sit down to meditate, begin watching your breath. Okay, he goes on at first, breathe normally. Uh, and then he suggests, um, no, I'm sorry. The instant you sit down to meditate, begin watching your breath. At first, breathe normally, gradually letting your breathing slow down until it is quiet, even, and the lengths of the breaths are fairly long. From the moment you sit down, to the moment your breathing has become deep and silent. Be conscious of everything that is happening in yourself. And you don't have to manipulate the length of your breaths. Making your breath calm and even is called the method of following one's breath. I used to find that term a little confusing following one's breath because it implied kind of a separation like there's something out in front of you and you're trotting along behind it so i like this making your breath calm and even is called the method of following one's breath um then he talks about counting your breath if that seems hard um he says in those moments when you are upset or dispersed <clears throat> and find it difficult to practice mindfulness. Return to the breath. Taking hold of your breath, returning to the breath, is itself mindfulness. Your breath is the wondrous method of taking hold of your consciousness. Um, breath is a, t is a tool. Breath itself is mindfulness. The use of breath as a tool may help one obtain many, I'm sorry, immense benefits, but these cannot be considered ends in themselves. These benefits are only the byproducts of the realization of mindfulness. So let's put that aside for just a second. Um, 
practicing meditation regardless of what you're doing. He suddenly veers off the topic of breath. Uh, he says, you've got to practice meditation when you walk, stand, sit, lie down, and work while washing your hands, washing the dishes, sweeping the floor, drinking the tea, talking to friends, or whatever you're doing. While washing the dishes, you might be thinking about the tea afterwards, and so try to get them out of the way as quickly as possible in order to sit down and drink tea. Um, he talks somewhere, I forget where he says, so you wash the dishes in that manner. What do you got? A few clean dishes. Well, I don't know about you, but sometimes I really just like a few clean dishes and I'm, I'm happy with that. Uh, but he says, you're not fully alive in that moment. Um, and at times I find myself actively resisting. You know, I just want to get through these dishes. I just want to wipe that counter clean and get, uh, now that I've had my eyes fixed, all the dirt that I see on it away. You know, I just want to be as efficient and moving forward as possible. Um, and he cautions against that. And as we've been talking about in the Dhammapada, that's not being fully alive. That's not, um, that's, as if you are already dead, but I'll get to that. Um, he recommends a day of mindfulness once a week. Very interesting. Uh, I'll leave that to you to read. Um, why should we meditate? I find his answer fascinating. First of all, because each of us needs to realize total rest. Hadn't thought of it that way. Even a night of sleep does not produce total rest. Um, he talks about lying down, sitting in the lotus position, uh, the various ways in which we can uh, meditate. He does talk about how to hold your neck Keep your back straight. The neck and head should be aligned with the spinal column. Uh, keep your eyes focused a yard or two in front of you. Uh, this goes on. He says what, what uh, Dogen says. Place your left hand palm side up in your right palm. Uh, let all the muscles in your hands, fingers, arms, and legs relax. Let go of everything. Um, he talks more about this. Uh, and then he provides a very interesting image that I don't want you to hold on to too tightly. I've never heard this before, but I found it very restful. He says, often it helps to meditate on the image of a pebble thrown into a river. Um, he says, how is one helped by the image of the pebble? He says, sit down in whatever position suits you best. Um, the half lotus or lotus back straight. Breathe slowly and deeply, mindful of each breath, following each breath, becoming one with the breath, which can't be helped. You don't have to try to do it. Just be mindful of it. Then let go of everything. Imagine yourself as a pebble which has been thrown into a river. The pebble sinks through the water effortlessly. Detached from everything, it falls by the shortest distance possible. Finally reaching the bottom, the point of perfect rest. You are like a pebble which has let itself fall into a, the river, letting go of everything. This is true rest. <laughs> At the center of your being is your breath. Very interesting. At the center of your being is your breath. I can't really go in, into now why that's very interesting, but I find that very interesting. You don't need to know the length of time it takes before reaching the point 
of complete rest on the bottom, on the bed of fine sand. When you feel yourself resting like a pebble, which has reached the riverbed, that is the point when you begin to find your own rest. You are no longer pushed or pulled by anything. If you cannot find joy in peace in these very moments of sitting, then the future itself will only flow by as a river flows by. You will not be able to hold it back. You will be incapable of living the future when it has become the present. Joy and peace. Are the joy and peace possible in this very hour of sitting? If you cannot find it here, you won't find it anywhere. Don't chase after your thoughts as a shadow follows its object. Don't run after your thoughts. Find joy and peace in this very moment. So I just want to read from the um, Dhammapada about that joy and peace that he's talking about. This is heedfulness. Heedfulness is the path to the deathless. Heedlessness is the path to death. The heedful, heedful die not. The heedless are as if dead already. So he's addressing this issue right here, right here when he says, If you cannot find joy in peace in these very moments of sitting, then the future itself will only flow by as a river flows by, and you will not be able to hold it back. You will be incapable of living the future when it has become the present. Joy and peace are the joy and peace possible in this very moment of sitting. If you cannot find it here, you won't find it anywhere. Don't chase after your thoughts as a shadow follows its object. Don't run after your thoughts. Find joy and peace in this very moment. So Friday night, when we were coming in and we were gonna uh, set up and uh, get ready for Friday night meditation, on the wall by the door, as you face the door, there's a, a, brick, a brick wall there. There was a skeleton, there was a skeleton a dead mouse. And I have to say, I was enthralled because the tail of the mouse was exquisitely skeletal. You could see every little aspect of the skeleton of the tail of this dead mouse. The rest of the mouse was not so pretty, but that tail, there was just, it was totally captivating. There was joy in looking at that tail. I, I know that sounds really bizarre, but I thought, wow, wow. I mean, it just, there, there it was. Just beautiful. But then I also thought of this little girl I know. Her name is um, Julia. I thought Julia would love this tail. She would just love, well, the reason I say that is because I've been with Julia when she's been on one of her um, walks when she was younger and everything is captivating. We were coming out of a restaurant, uh, um, a Mexican restaurant that used to be Jason's Deli in Edina. First of all, she was enthralled by the pinatas hanging from the ceiling. She could not get over the small, donkeys, the baby donkey pinatas versus the adult donkey pinatas. Do you remember? She was captivated by these pinatas. You don't remember? Cat so she kept pointing at them. I mean, it was just her joy, her delight was so infectious. 
Then we get outside. And what captivates her next? The little green clover-like plants growing up in the cracks of the sidewalk. Oh, go, go over there. And she points <laughs> almost microscopic plants growing up in the cracks of the sidewalk or the fuzz, the green fuzz that was in these urns where people would put out, they were really for the plants, but people would put out their cigarette butts in them. She was oblivious to that. She was fascinated by this green fuzz growing on this surface of the um, dirt in the pots. So we'd go from crack to crack, looking at the clover-like uh, plants growing up in the cracks. She'd be exclaiming with delight. That's, that's joy, that's, that's I think what he's talking about here. Although, you know, we gotta tone it down for the Zendo. But I learned a lot from her. I learned a great deal from walking with her. And just every time she'd point out one of these um, teeny tiny clover-like plants, clover leaf like plants growing up in the cracks at the sidewalk. You remember that? She's gotten older now. And she's very territorial. So we go to the pizza place, uh, Pizza Luce, and she's moving her boundaries. She set up a boundary with, I forget how she delineated her boundaries. Do you remember? Because she had her toys with her, her dolls, and her dolls had to have a space. And opposite her was, was David. And I could see her testing the limits of those boundaries, pushing however she was defining it, maybe the salt and pepper, I can't remember, or maybe the napkin, pushing it back, encroaching into David's territory. I was wondering how far she was going to go with, with uh, setting out her area for her dolls. And I was just watching her, just very calmly observing her test those boundaries it was really interesting. I learned a lot from that little girl. Um, but she was she was remarkably um, subtle. But I think having someone just observe her was also helpful in a way. Um, anyway. Someone might well ask, is relaxation then the only goal of meditation. Hope I haven't missed that part. Yeah. In fact, the goal of meditation goes much deeper than that. While relaxation is the necessary point of departure. Once one has realized relaxation, it is possible to realize a tranquil heart and a clear mind. To realize a tranquil heart and clear mind is to have gone far along the path to meditation. Okay. Where is that? That was so interesting. By the way, the Sutra of Mindfulness, um, I, I thought I had the name of that. Oh, that's very interesting. Oh, here it is. Yeah. He quotes a Zen master whose name I'm not going to try to pronounce. If the practitioner knows his own mind clearly, he will obtain results with little effort, without any intention to get anything. But if he does not know anything about his own mind, all of his effort will be wasted. 
If you want to know your own mind, there is only one way, to observe and recognize everything about it. This must be done at all times, during your day-to-day -day life, no less than during the hour of meditation. And again, I've experienced some resistance to this. So in the shower, observing one's own mind, paying attention to what one's doing. Uh, do you remember to wash <laughs> the conditioner out of your hair? I mean, let's we can get down to the basics here. Uh, so being mindful, um, uh, not splashing water all over the place. Um, As we all know very well, during meditation, various feelings and thoughts may arise. If you don't practice mindfulness of the breath, these thoughts will soon lure you away from mindfulness. But the breath isn't simply a means by which to chase away such thoughts and feelings. Breath remains the vehicle to unite body and mind and to open the gate to wisdom. When feeling or thought arises, your intention should not be to chase it away. Even if by continuing to concentrate on the breath, the feeling or thought passes naturally from the mind, which it will, um, the intention isn't to chase it away to hate it, worry about it, or be frightened by it. So what exactly should you be doing concerning such thoughts and feelings? Simply acknowledge their presence, recognize them. I like the image of recognizing. David and I went to our favorite restaurant or the one we go to on Friday nights. And there was a young woman there I hadn't seen uh, since possibly before the pandemic. I don't know. Anyway, instantly I recognized her. I couldn't think of her name, but the recognition was instant. And so I like the term recognizing the thought, acknowledging it, seeing it, just seeing it. And then he says, a feeling of sadness has just arisen in me. We all know this. Um, if the feeling of sadness continues, just continue to recognize a feeling of sadness is still in me. In fact, I wouldn't even go so far as to say in me. Um, I think just a wordless, I think it's possible to wordlessly acknowledge sadness. We're familiar enough with sadness just to recognize it without having to name it or label it. Um, the essential thing is not to let any feeling or thought arise without recognizing it in mindfulness. And then it gives a very interesting image, like a palace guard who is aware of every face that passes through the front corridor. If there are no feelings or thought present, then recognize that. So the palace guard, um, Oh, wait, then he talks about while practicing mindfulness, don't be dominated by a distinction between good and evil, thus creating a battle within oneself. Um, whenever a wholesome thought arises, acknowledge it. Um, however you do that. And if an unwholesome thought arises, acknowledge it or recognize it as well. Don't dwell on it or try to get rid of it. Um, if you have departed, he says, and then you must know you have departed. And if you are still there, know you are still there. Once you have reached such an awareness, there will be nothing you need fear anymore. And then he says, when I mentioned the guard at the emperor's gate, perhaps you imagined a front corridor with two doors, one entrance and one exit, with your mind as the guard. Whatever feeling or thought enters, you're aware 
of its entrance and when it leaves, you are aware of its exit. But the image has a shortcoming. It suggests that those who enter and exit the corridor are different from the guard. In fact, our thoughts and feelings are ourselves. They are a part of ourselves. There is a temptation to look upon them, or at least some of them, as an enemy force, which is trying to um, storm the gates or disturb the concentration and understanding of our mind. But in fact, he says, when we are angry, we are anger. And when we are happy, we are happiness. When we have certain thoughts, we are those thoughts. We are both the guard and the visitor at the same time. We are both the mind and the observer of the mind. Um, the Xin Ming says, and you know, I've puzzled over this, and this has helped me a great deal. The Xin Ming says, when no discriminating thoughts arise, the mind ceases to appear. When mind vanishes, things follow it. Object is object for the subject. Subject is subject for the object. The thoroughgoing relativity of these two is originally one emptiness. And then it says, in emptiness, mind and thing are indistinguishable, and each contains within itself the whole world. That's what he's saying here. Um, mind does not grab onto mind. Mind does not push mind away. Mind can only observe mind. This observation isn't an observation of some object outside and independent of the observer. I don't really understand this, but it's interesting. He says, remember the koan of the Zen master, somebody, I don't recognize the name, who asked, what is the sound of one hand clapping? Or take the example of the taste the tongue experiences what separates taste and taste bud. The mind experiences itself directly within itself. This is of special importance. And so in the Sutra of Mindfulness, Buddha always uses the phrasing, mindfulness of feeling in feeling, mindfulness of mind in mind. Some have said that the Buddha used this phrasing in order to put emphasis on such words as feeling and mind, but I don't think they have fully grasped the Buddha's intention. Mindfulness of feeling in feeling is mindfulness of feeling directly while experiencing feeling. While, and certainly not contemplation of some image of feeling. Very, very interesting. Um, there's a book I want to read called uh, Cultivating the um, Empty Field, which I think, think touches on that. Cynthia Scott talked about this, this um, mindfulness of feeling and feeling, this directly experiencing mindfulness of feeling while experiencing feeling in her workshop. But anyway, um, he says, descriptive words make it sound like a riddle or a paradox or a tongue twister. <laughs> tongue twister. Mindfulness of feeling and feeling is the mind experiencing mindfulness of the mind in the mind. The objectivity of an outside observer to examine something is the method of science, but it is not the method of meditation. Thus, the image of the guard and the visitor fails to illustrate ad adequately the mindful observation of mind in which mind is not separate from actual observation or from what it actually observes. There is no separation. 
he says, mind contemplating mind is like an object in its shadow. The object cannot shake the shadow off. The two are one. Wherever the mind goes, it still lies in the harness of the mind. The sutra sometimes uses the expression, find the monkey, meaning monkey mind. Uh, the, the monkey mind that uh, flits from branch to branch, swings through the jungle, <laughs> um, thought is dispersed. But he says, um, but the monkey image is only a means of expression. Once the mind is directly and continually aware of itself, it is no longer a monkey. There are not two minds, one which swings from branch to branch and another which follows after to bind it with a piece of rope. <laughs> I like that. Um, the person who practices meditation usually hopes to see his or her own nature in order to obtain awakening. Um, but if you are just beginning, don't wait to just see your, into your own nature. Better yet, don't wait for anything. Especially, don't wait to see the Buddha or any version of reality while you're sitting. Um, I'm going to quit soon. Once you are able to quiet your mind, once your feelings and thoughts no longer disturb you, and this is not a permanent state. This is not an end state. This is not, okay, the job is done. I'm finished. That's it. Uh, this is an ongoing endeavor. This is, as Jed says, way-seeking mind. Um, once you are able to quiet your mind, once your feeling and thoughts no longer disturb you, at that point, your mind will begin to dwell in mind. Your mind will take hold of mind in a direct and wondrous way, which no longer differentiates between subject and object. Mind and thing are indistinguishable, and each contains within itself the whole world. Drinking a cup of tea, the seeming distinction between the one who drinks the tea and the tea being drunk evaporates. Drinking a cup of tea becomes a direct and wondrous experience in which the distinction between subject and object no longer exists. Like the experience of that little girl and her joy, Julia's joy in seeing that, that green emerging between the cracks of the sidewalk or the exquisite reality of the tail, <laughs> the skeleton tail of that dead mouse, which I just thought was so fascinating. Anyway, he says, dispersed mind, diluted mind, dispersed mind is also mind, just as waves rippling in water are also water. When mind has taken hold of mind, diluted mind becomes true mind. True mind is our real self, is the Buddha, the pure oneness, which cannot be cut up by the illusory divisions of separate selves created by concepts and language. We've all heard this a million times. He says, but I don't wanna say a lot about this. He doesn't, want... anyway, I'm done. That's all I'm, I do have page 60 and 61 written down. Let me just look and see what I, why I thought that was. This book is full of different kinds of meditations. Oh, and a fascinating dialogue between um, an old man and the emperor. Very, and it's uh, recounted by Tolstoy. Does any of you know this dialogue? It's really interesting um, about the emperor who goes to visit a hermit to ask him three very important questions. He wanted to know the answers to these three questions. 
and the emperor is searching high and low. People give him ideas. And uh, the three questions are on page, the whole thing starts on page 69 of this book. And I'm not going to read it because it's going to take too long, but it's wonderful. It's really wonderful. What is the best time to do each thing? The second question, who are the most important people to work with? And the third question, what is the most important thing to do at all times? And we, we might have some pat answers to that, but in this, in Tolstoy's recounting of the story between the emperor and the hermit, a very interesting scenario evolves that doesn't rely on any pat answers that can apply to any situation, regardless of what's showing up, any, any situation that provides the answer to these three questions. So I recommend the book if you're interested in the answers. So I'm done. Questions or comments? Andrew. It's either a question or I just, when you were speaking about the breath, I just had a funny memory. Uh, several years ago here at Dharma Field, there was a practitioner who she was doing meditation and also doing yoga, right? Right. Real different styles of breathing in those two practices. And she shared a funny story that she was here in the Zendo one morning and she started breathing in a yoga breath, which is really loud and yeah. recording. And uh, she completely kind of forgot where she was for yeah. a moment. And Steve Hagen's like, uh, we try to keep the breath down here, right? Well, just this morning, I before I came here, I took my very first yoga class and the exact opposite thing happened. I was there trying to be very quiet and still with my breath. Yeah. And everyone around me is just snorting and grunting. <laughs> so I thought it was a, a very timely talk that you gave, just thinking about the breath, you know. I guess the end yeah. the end point yeah. is, you know, it's it's good just to be breathing, however it happens. Just keep breathing. <laughs> I also think to breathe quietly in the zendo is important. Of course. It yeah. shows an awareness that we know we are meditating with others. Yeah. You know, um, there's a lot to be said about meditating with others, how it encourages and helps not only our own practice, but the practice of others. I know you've talked about that at length. Steve Hagen has talked about that. We are all meditating together and it's enormously helpful. Um, and that's true, no matter who's in the Zendo, uh, maybe you're sitting alone. That's We are always meditating with others and it's not others in any sense of other. But there's a whole lot to be said about that. But um, so being considerate of those around you is important in the Zendo. But do you know what I like to use? What is it called? Yogic breathing when you purse lip breathing, where you inhale and then you exhale through purse lips. I don't recommend it for the Zendo, but boy, it can keep you awake if you're falling asleep while driving. I sometimes rely on it to help me with drowsiness by driving, just inhaling. It also calms your mind if you're anxious, just that release of the breath through the pursed lips. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? From anybody online? Okay. Oh. Okay. Then, thank you all very much. Thank you.